3, verse 16. And it says this, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever, somebody say whosoever, whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have, somebody say, but have, everlasting life. If you allow me a few moments, I want to expand upon and expound upon this verse and passage of Scripture. And I want to give you a thought for this morning. The encompassing love of God. The encompassing love of God. And so, this is how God's love works towards us. We find in 1 John chapter 4, in verse 9, he says, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says that this is how the love of God was manifested towards us. That he sent his only begotten son that we might live through him. Does anybody in this place want to live through him? And so the text tells us that he gave, and then John tells us in 1 John chapter 4 that he sent. So he gave, and to make sure that he gave it to us, he sent it to us. He sent him to us, and he manifested his love in this manner that he gave us his only. He sent his only begotten son that we might live through him. So if we're not living through him, then we're not experiencing life in the abundance that he intended to give it to us. He said, I came that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. But you're not going to realize life in its abundance until you live it through Christ. Are you hearing what I'm saying so far? And so, this is how he loves us so much, is that while he was manifesting his love for us and he sent his son to us, he wanted us to know that love is indicative of his actions. Do you understand what I'm saying? Love is indicative of his actions, and I just came to inform a few of you that might not have heard it in a long time. So I came to inform a few of you and to remind the rest of us that you're loved. And how many of us ever been loved by somebody so much and so that when we understand that they love us, it changes our condition. I, I'm, I'm reminded of my son, and my son, he just comes in the morning, and he wants his hug, and he just wants to know that he's loved. You ain't got to say a whole lot to him. You ain't even got to do too much for him. He just wants to know that he's loved. And I wonder how many of us feel that same love towards God. I just want to know that I'm loved. God, you don't have to do anything for me. I know I'm looking for blessings on blessings. I I'm looking for prosperity, but could you just love on me? So I just came to inform some of you and, and remind the rest of us that God loves you. Somebody say, he loves me. This is the foundational love of God. Somebody say the foundational love of God. The foundational love of God is also found in 1 John chapter 4, verse 19. And it says that we love him because he first loved us. The only reason you and I understand how to operate love, how to even perform in love, is that we were given an in sample. Do you understand what I'm telling you? This is instructional purposes personified. And so in his instructional love towards us, he said, I don't want you to just have this thought of love because us in our culture, we think, we say we love everything. We love games. We love things. We love stuff. We love houses. We love everything. So just love is just a misappropriated word in our culture. But in the Hebraic, it has a much deeper meaning. And he says, I love you, and, uh, and I don't want you to just take your own definition of it, because if you're going to love me in biblical proportions, you're going to have to do it by the way I showed it to you. So he says, ah, you lo we love him because he first loved us. And love is indicative of his actions, and that takes us to the next type of love that God has to us that's right there in the text. The sacrificial love of God. For God so loved the world that he gave 
He gave. He so loved the world that he gave. Somebody say he did that. Yeah, he did that. He gave his only begotten son. This is the sacrificial love of God. The text tells us in Romans chapter 8, he tells this, I believe it's verse 32, that he says that God spared not his own son. You understand how expensive love really is. He spared no expense. Somebody ought to celebrate God right there that he spared no expense, that he gave his only begotten son for you and I. He gave that to us. He provided that for us because he loved us. The word love in the Hebraic is the word ahava. Somebody say ahava. And the root word of ahava is ahav. And ahav means to give. See, you and I, we're so used to reciprocity that we don't understand what real love is. Because some of us only base love only on reciprocity. And love does not always constitute reciprocity. Let me prove it to you. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Before you had an opportunity to do anything for God, he had already done everything for you. Somebody say he loves me. Oh, I feel that thing. He said he loves me, and he did something about it. He didn't just speak it. He commanded his son that he come down here, and if I can take this liberty, I believe that while Jesus was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he remembered that folks wasn't loving on him, but he loved on his father. So he said, since I love my father so much, I've got to do something to show my love, not only for the people I came to serve, but for the God who created everything. He did it for the love of it. Y'all have heard me say this before, and I'll say it again. You don't fall into love. You give into it. You don't fall into love. You give into it. So you must give into love. If you want to show love, you must sow something. Oh, and I'm not talking about currency that's of capital nature. What I'm talking about is you must sow your devotion. You must serve. You must sow your sincerity. You must sow your time. If you're not willing to give God any of your time, then I don't know if you can call that love, ladies and gentlemen. Some of us say if the service lasts, if the sermon lasts longer than 40 minutes, then it's too long. You don't want to give 40 minutes to God who has given you life, health, and strength. He loves us. And if we were really to understand the depths of what he gave to us, the opportunity, he died for our opportunity. I love saying that. He died. There was no guarantee. He knows. But there was no guarantee. He says, I'm going to die so that you have an opportunity for eternity. He says, I'm going to die so you have the opportunity for eternity. Do you understand what I'm saying? I just want you to have a chance. And I'm going to show you how to do it. I'm not going to just be instructional. I'm going to be sacrificial. I'm going to be an example before you. I'm going to send my son. Can I go so far as I'm going to send myself because Jesus is God. (laughs) Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeshua is God. And so he can't, it is God in flesh. It is the word in flesh. Do you understand what I'm saying? So he sent himself to us. He sent himself to us so he can show, he said, look, you can do my word in the flesh. No, 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 you don't understand. You can do what I ask you to do in this flesh. See, some of us want to blame our limitations on the flesh. What you not realize is this, that the Son of God had the same flesh that you and I have. And so if he can do the will of God in his flesh, you and I have to be ready to do the will of God in our flesh. Do you understand what I'm saying? And so I sit before God. And I start to think about and dwell upon his love for me. So I understand and I receive the foundational love of God. And I receive the sacrificial love of God who gave everything. Somebody say everything. Everything. He gave everything for me. He didn't spare his own son. He didn't spare his own son. And so we move to the impartial love of God. The impartial love of God, whosoever. Somebody say whosoever. He says whosoever will believe in him. Whosoever will believe in him. Now, it's impartial, but there's a caveat, ladies and gentlemen. 
He said, whosoever, that means anybody, race, color, creed, it does not matter. Whosoever would believe in me. Whosoever is everybody. The text tells us elsewhere in Scripture that Jesus himself, Christ himself says this. He says, whosoever will confess me before men, I will confess them before my Father. Are you hearing what I'm saying? So if you would just be so bold to confess him before mankind, he will confess you. He will confess you before his father. The father who loves us so much that he sent us the entryway to eternity. Aren't you glad about that? Because it was difficult trying to work out everything in our flesh. That's why the old covenant, as it's called, didn't work because they were trying to do everything in their flesh. But God said, I'm going to send you somebody in flesh that though they're in flesh, they don't operate in flesh. They operate by spirit. Those that are the sons of God, they are led by the spirit of God. So when I'm led by the spirit of God, I can operate under the grace of God, which gives me the endowment to do the will of God in my flesh. Are you hearing what I'm saying? This is the impartial love of God that he doesn't care. Whoever calls there, whoever, whoever calls on the name of the Lord, they shall be what? Saved. You ain't got to go through all these 900 steps. The man on the cross only had one chance. He got up there. He said, look here. He said, remember me, but you won't understand how powerful that statement was because he understood that he was apart from his God. And he says, remember me. In other words, rejoin me back into who you are. Remember me when you come into your father's presence. And Jesus is like, I know where your heart is. So sometimes we're trying to think about the vernacular of what to say to God when all you have to have is the right heart for God. He didn't understand everything to say. He didn't get baptized, did he? Was he filled with the Holy Ghost? No, he wasn't. But he was sincere. And he said, God, could you just remember me? And God said, I do you want better this day somebody say this day he said this day you will be with me not in poverty he said you will be with me in paradise not in the pits of hell but in paradise because your heart is sincere and your heart is right hallelujah and we give his name praise amen thank you so we're talking about the love of God the foundational love of God the sacrificial love of God the impartial love of God. But wait. Somebody say wait. There's more. See, there's more. There's the transformational love of God. He says, whoever believes in me, that's your opportunity to transform, to come out of the old person that you used to be. And because understand this, that the same body that you were sinning with is the same body that now you have salvation with. But he transforms your mindset, and so you use your energy differently. Hello, somebody. And so the same, the same nasty body that was laying around with everything now finds itself laying prostrate on the floor why because I've been changed and if I gotta be so careful can I go back up the sacrificial real quick because not only was he the sacrificial uh, the, the sacrificial love of God that he gave us not only in the sense that he died for us but you got to understand the depths to what he did for us because the Holy Ghost just brought this back to my mind that not only is he our Savior he is our Savior because he saved our lives somebody say he saved my life he saved my life, and this is how he did it. He's our Savior. Somebody say, he's my Savior. So he's my Savior, but he did two he did some sacrificial things. One of those sacrificial things that he was the sacrificial lamb. And what the sacrificial lamb does is that the sacrificial lamb is slaughtered. Slaughtered. Perfect. Without spot. Without blemish. Perfect. He was slaughtered. Because only blood, somebody say only blood. only blood. Only blood brings about the remission of sin. And he says, sacrifices thou wouldest not, but you have prepared a body for me. And so when you prepared a body for me, I understood that it was my body to give back to you. And I was going to give this body and give my blood for the cleansing of a people who needed a savior. And so I shed my blood willingly because I love my father and I love the people that he sent me to. So I did something about it. So he's our savior. He's the sacrificial lamb. And guess what else he is? He is the scapegoat. 
And a scapegoat is the vessel in which God sends the blame outside the parameters of the kingdom. I don't understand. I don't know if you understand what I just said. You ain't got nobody to blame because your blame shouldn't even be in the kingdom. I said your blame should not be in the kingdom. Your blame should have been put on the scapegoat and exiled outside of the city walls of the kingdom. I don't know why you blame a church folk for stuff that they did when the blame was supposed to be put on him and outside the kingdom. He said, I got, I got a place for you to put your blame. Blame it on me. Blame it on me. Put it, put it on me. It wasn't even them because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principality. He said, put the blame on me. It's not on them. Put it on me. So why are you sitting up there hesitating, holding back your own blessing because you will not forgive somebody? You got to understand you shouldn't be blaming them. What you ought to do is forgive them because we ought to forgive our debts. We say, Lord, forgive our debts as you forgive our debtors. So our forgiveness hinges on our forgiveness. No, no, no. I said our forgiveness hinges on our forgiveness. Let me say it one more time. Our forgiveness hinges on our forgiveness. You holding up your own blessing because you holding blame that should be outside of the kingdom. They sinned against me. Their sin is on him outside the kingdom. Do you understand what I'm saying? He sent it out. He cast it out. So that's the sacrificial love of God. And we talked about the impartial love of God. And we're talking about now the transformational love of God. Whosoever believes in him, whoever believes in him, the text says, shall not perish, but have. That's where the change happens. Shall not perish, but have. In other words, salvation is non-perishable. Oh, my God, I hope you understand what I just told you. I said salvation is non-perishable. Once you got saved, that means it was already sealed up. What you got to understand was faith, once faith is established, eternity is realized. Do you get that? He said, whosoever believes in me shall not perish but have. There wasn't no other section in there. He said, once you believe, you will have. You're just waiting to realize <laughs> eternity. Can anybody get happy in God about that, that you're just waiting to realize eternity? That's all. You, you're just waiting. You're just waiting to realize eternity because your salvation is secured upon your belief. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because he intended for you. He already saved you by when he took away the penalty of sin. He's saving you by his amazing grace. Amen. And he will save you from destruction. He will save us from the second death, which is permanent separation from him. You've already been saved three times over. It's just one you're waiting to realize. And that's eternity. Give God praise right there. Because that's the transformation. That's the transformational love of God. The transformational love of God. He said, I'm changing your life. Can anybody wave their hand in this building that their life has been changed since they decided to make Jesus, to make Yeshua, to make the Christ, to make the Messiah their Lord? Has your life been changed? Yeah. I didn't say it was going to be easy, but I say it's been changed. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? The transformational God. So he it says it's non-perishable. I didn't give it to you for a probationary period. I gave it to you for a permanent possession. Everybody looking for possessions when you possess eternity right now. We're looking for worldly temporary possessions, and that has its place, but it should never have its place over the place that God has said, I'm giving you eternity if you would come to me, if you would just confess me before men, I'll confess you before my father. Because if Christ don't recognize you, you ain't getting in. You know, that cartoon, I kind of like what it says. Say real, recognize real. And you don't look familiar. And so sometimes we got to understand that God says, I recognize my own. I've got to change something about you. I've got to adopt you. Amen. I got to adopt you in a way that you receive the adoption is when you receive the blood over your life. 
Do you know that blood changes something about you? It takes the sin away from you, but it literally changes your mechanism. That's how you can operate different. That Your flesh isn't different. Your blood is. Somebody give God praise right there. I said your flesh ain't different. Your blood is. You got a different DNA. Hmm? You've got destiny from the Nazarene <laughs> that's been appointed to you and been anointed over you. DNA. Anyway, do you get what I'm just saying? So your composition has been changed so that you can be delivered. And it says this about God, that he spared not his own son, but he delivered him. So let me get this straight. He gave him to us. He sent him to us. And then he delivered him up. How much more he got to do for us? He gave him to you. He sent him to us. And then he delivered him up to us, sparing not his own son. That is the transformational love of God because he's changed things in our life. I've got one more thing to tell you. The eternal love of God. The eternal love of God. Because the verse says this, he says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have what? That is the eternal love of God. The eternal love of God. Scripture says that we realize, and I'm paraphrasing, but we realize eternal life through Jesus Christ, who is our Lord. This is eternal life through Christ Jesus. Do you hear what I'm saying? This is eternal life. The gift of eternal life. Thank you, Holy Ghost. The gift of eternal life is given to us. In Christ Jesus, our risen and our ascended Lord. Do you understand what I'm saying? This is life eternal. John tells us this in chapter 10. He says, Jesus is speaking. And he says, my sheep. My sheep know my voice. And I know them. And they follow me. And I give them eternal life but here's the part that I love the part that I love that he says that no man <laughs> I'm telling you today that your salvation is secure because he says no man can snatch them out of my hands no man can snatch them out of my hands and not only can no man snatch them out of my hands but it goes on a couple verses later I believe a verse later it says no man can snatch them out of my father's hands so once you have come into true salvation, you cannot be snatched out of the hands of God. And so that's why we talk about the encompassing love of God, because the encompassing love of God is the embracing love of God. Does anybody feel embraced by the love of God? Because encompassing means that he embraces us in all his love. Love covers a multitude of sin. Love cast out all fear. Love, love cast out all blame as well. Do you understand what I'm saying? So he encompasses us with his love. Another defined for encompassing is covering. He covers us. Love covers. I don't know about some of y'all, but if I look back over my life, I don't like to stay back there too long. I don't know about y'all. Y'all might have been y'all might have been clean as a whistle, which is a dirty and filthy thing, by the way. But uh, you might have been clean as a as a whistle. But 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 my life got some spots in it. Do you understand what I'm saying? But I'm glad that in, in spite of my spots, God blotted them. He said, "I'm gonna take out every mistake. I'm not gonna even see what you've done." Do you understand that when God sees you, He can't see your failures if you're covered in the blood. You don't want hung up on your failures. You don't want hang up on your mishap. God doesn't even see that because you're covered in the blood. He said, I will blot out all your iniquities and remember them no more. Somebody say he loves me. He loves you so much that he says, I'm not going to over, I'm not just going to overlook, I'm going to forget. The all-knowing, all-seeing, all says, I'm going to forget all of your errors. 
so that we can have right relationship. Some of us need to understand that in the relate, right relationships that we're in. You want to keep holding on to stuff that they did 10 years ago. You ain't going to never be in right relationship with them if you keep holding it over their head, baby doll. I'm so glad that God doesn't hold my arrows over my head. I'm so glad that God doesn't hold the stuff that I did over my head. Because anybody that say that they forgive you, sometimes when they say they forgive you, but they'll remind you, I remember when. No, you ain't forgiving me if you keep telling me you remember when. Because if you remember it, to me then it becomes a part of me and that's why you can't have right relationship with me because when you see me you see the wrong that I did to you instead of the person that I become somebody give God glory that he doesn't hold your error over your head somebody say he loves me he embraces you he embraces you he covers you. And the last defining for encompassing is being surrounded on all sides. There's no one who can pluck you up. There's no one who can snatch you out. There's no one who can pull you. And once you have this kind of confidence in God, that is when you can say the scripture in the way that it was intended to say, nothing can separate me from the love of God. He says it like this, I am fully persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God. But you got to understand this, that he's not saying that because he thinks it's something in and of himself. He says, I am fully persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God. Why am I fully persuaded that nothing can separate me from the love of God? Because I believe in his promises and I believe in his words. By the way, when he says shall, that is a promise. Do you understand what I'm saying? He says shall not per perish but have. Somebody say that's a promise. That's a promise. He gave that to us. He gave it to us. Let me tell you something else about love real quick. Love is the environment created by giving. Love is an environment created by giving. So God created a different environment for you. That is how you can walk in this world and not be affected by it. <laughs> you got to understand that you're in a different environment. <laughs> Some people think that you're in a bubble. No, I'm not in a bubble. I'm just in a different environment. The reason things don't affect me the way that they affect you because you're not in him. And see, when I'm in him, I live through him. That's what the text says. It says, I live through him. So stuff that affects some of y'all that ain't in Christ, it don't affect me. It's not that I don't go through it. It's just that it doesn't affect me. And it doesn't affect me because I'm living through him. So I have life abundant. Even when I'm struggling, I got life abundant because I'm living in him because he loves me. Somebody say he loves me. He loves me. He loves me so much. See, this is what he tried to do in Eden. Oh, y'all got to hear me. This is what he tried to do in Eden. He tried to love us in Eden, but we didn't love him like that. He tried to do this in Eden. He created an environment. Oh, my God. He created an environment for us. Before he even created man, he created an environment for him. Oh, I got to hear you say, we love him because he first loved us. He said, I'm going to set up a whole environment for you. You don't even understand. You ought to give God glory that you are in the dispensation of grace because you walked into an environment of grace. You walked into an environment of salvation. You walked into an environment where what you're doing is waiting on eternity. Somebody say, I'm waiting on eternity. I'm waiting on eternity because he loves me. And I'm fully persuaded that height, no death, no principalities, no powers, nothing can separate me from his love. I can't be separated from his love because nothing can snatch me from him. There's nothing that I'm doing. The only reason I'm convinced is because he did everything for me. Huh, you don't think I understand what I'm saying? You say it can't nothing snatch you from the love of God? I am fully persuaded. Let me make sure you understand the text. I am fully persuaded that nothing, somebody say nothing. 
But let me give you the foundational love behind that thought pattern. The reason why I am fully persuaded, because Christ himself tells me, you ain't got to look to none of the apostles, none of the prophets. You can look to Christ himself. He says, my sheep. Somebody say, my sheep. Are you his sheep? Are you in the sheepfold? He said, my sheep know my voice. And those who know his voice, he says, they follow me. I love them. I know them. And they follow me. And I give them. I love on them. I give them eternal life. My sheep know my voice. Hmm? They know me. I know them. And they follow me. So not only is love indicative of his action, love is also indicative of obedience. Do you understand what I'm saying? So my sheep know me. In other words, we have intimacy. There is a relationship. And by the way, eternal life, that's hashtag relationship goals. That's relationship goals. Do you understand what I'm telling you? And so when we get to understanding that life eternal is guaranteed for me, as long as I love on him and I believe in him, and I believe in him, he gave me everything I need to believe in him. But love is an action word. What am I doing for God? I can't earn anything, but what am I doing to show him my love? Am I giving him my time? Am I giving him my sincerity? Am I giving him my devotion? I should give him everything. We used to sing a song, I'm yours, Lord. Everything I am, everything I'm not, everything I have, everything I got. But do you really love him like that? We're asked for time to study. And we don't want to give it. We're asked for time to pray. And we don't want to give it. Oh, Lord, don't let, us, don't let nobody ask for no offering now. And we ain't asking for one today neither. But don't let us. Oh, no, 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 no. God don't need my money. Do you love that money or do you love him? Yeah. Whose time is worth more to you? So if you ain't willing to spend your money, fine. That's between you and God. Are you willing to spend some time? To a God who's provided for you and I eternal life, the eternal love of God. But it says this, I'm almost out your way for real. That I love you and I'm surrounding you on all sides. My sheep know my voice. I give them eternal life. No man can snatch them out of my hands. No man can snatch them out of my father's hand. Some of us think that we are so strong in the faith when really we ought to understand that it's my weakness that he's made strong. It's not that I'm doing anything. It's not that, oh, you're so strong in the faith. No, he's so strong. He's so strong. That's the reason I'm holding on because he's so strong because quiet as it kept. I don't want to give up. I don't want to give up multiple times. I've wanted to quit multiple times. Can I get anybody that's real in this place that said, I've wanted to quit multiple times. And sometimes we say it like this. I don't know how I kept holding on. Baby, you wasn't holding on. He was holding on to you because he loves you. He embraced you in his hand. And he says, no matter how much you try to win, a lot of this thing. I love you so much that I won't let you go. I won't let you go. I won't let you go. Can everybody give God a praise in this house that he loves you? The encompassing love of God is all around you. It's embracing you. It's covering you. He shed his blood for that. Somebody say he did that. And I got relationship goals to live with him forevermore. So I say, Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for your love. Thank you for what you've done. Now, Father, I know it's nothing that I can earn. But what can I do for you? I came to inform some people. And to remind the rest of us that in this treasury of scripture, he loves us. 
I came to express to you one thing simple. He loves us and he gave. He sent and he delivered a savior, a sacrificial lamb, a scapegoat. So that you and I could have a right, not an entitlement, not an entitlement, but a right to the tree of life. I love this environment because it loves me. I ain't talking about this church, y'all. I'm talking about the four walls of this church. I'm talking about his love. Some of us think that love is an emotion. Love is an effort that must be executed continuously. He loves us. Anybody feel his love in this place? Someone say one more time, he loves me. It's personal. It's a personal love. It's foundational. Hmm? It's impartial. It's sacrificial. It's transformational. It's eternal. It's instructional. It's personal. It's encompassing. The encompassing love of God. Give God praise all over this place.